What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Whiskey Web and Whatnot on a special International Whiskey Day with your hosts, Robbie the Wagner and Charles William Carpenter the Third. No jokes. Ah, but I just want to see how long <laughs> you I can like make you pause. You look like you're going to say something, so I stop, but then you don't. We have a special guest today, Rich Harris. What's going on, Rich? I'm good. I'm so honored to be doing this specific podcast on this specific day. Yeah, yeah it we, worked out. We timed, we timed it out perfectly. We've been planning this for months. We were like, Rich is the one to celebrate International Whiskey Day with us. And so we're, we're glad you could do it. Yeah, very happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who may not have heard of you, can you give a few sentences about who you are and what you do? Oh, God, I hate this bit. Yeah, all right, so I'm... I'm a guy who writes software for a living. I do that at the cell. The software in question is Svelte, which is a UI framework. Been working on it for about seven years at this point. Seven? Oof. Seven and a half. Long time. Prior to the cell, I worked in the news, news business for a long time. Worked at The Guardian, New York Times, using JavaScript to help tell the news. And now I just write Svelte all day. Yeah. Cool. That's- it's not a bad gig if you can get it. Uh, what are your feelings yeah. on cheese? <laughs> Love cheese. I mean, does anyone not like cheese? Is there anyone not, who doesn't like cheese? There uh, are there people. are people apart from but, people who are like lactose intolerant and well, and therefore my wife unable is lacto- to. My wife is lactose intolerant and she likes it, so it's not even a that thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah I had a but, boss once who like didn't like. Cheese, like mac and cheese i think i forget if he didn't like all cheese but like he would if somebody put cheese on his sandwich he would like call and complain or whatever and so i was like i don't know just okay. it feels weird to me that like like that's the best part of the sandwich but okay I, I, yeah i don't trust those people <laughs> if you don't like cheese i don't know it's like that's the that would probably be one of the hardest things about uh being a vegan which i'm not mm-hmm. obviously because i love cheese because i love cheese and the not real cheese just isn't cheese yeah, yeah. although it's I getting think- there a love of cheese is one of humanity's great levelers, honestly. Yeah, it's amazing what we do with like mold, you know, <laughs> yeah. chemicals. It is. It, it's crazy. Just like you, you, you get some, some bacteria and mold together and you can make amazing things. I've been really into brewing kombucha lately. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Which is like I, I have this vat on the, on the shelf behind me. With and the it, alien it's just like this, scoby, right? Yeah, like this jellyfish looking thing. That's just <laughs> swimming around in some cold tea and like periodically it produces a beautiful drink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you've had good results. Would recommend? Would definitely recommend. I'm still like dialing it in. It's been working, going at this a couple of months or so, so haven't yet figured out all of the tricks of the trade, but it's, it's going well. I recommend mm-hmm. it. Anyone who <laughs> wants to cultivate a weird bacterial colony on the <laughs> <laughs> on the kitchen counter this is a I, way I, to do it i do have a weird thing for like fermented foods i love i love fermented mm. foods i don't know that mm-hmm. there's any that i've had that i didn't like so you know i think it's kind of stems from like growing up with lots of sauerkraut i don't know yeah all right good yeah. well before we you teach us how to do that long time. we could yeah. <laughs> yeah before you teach us how to do that because that's mostly why i wanted to talk to you i don't know about this spell thing or whatever but I heard you were into kombucha, and I'm like, finally, someone can show us how to do that. So <laughs> it'll be great. All right, today we're having the Lagavulin Offerman Edition Charred Oak Cask Islay. I always say it wrong. Isla? Islay? I don't know. Do you know? No. I, okay. I think it's Islay, but. Islay. Yeah, that I sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah. You are more adjacent to where these things are produced, and so I feel like. Not currently, but I mean, you're from England, so you should know. That's kind of was my point. <laughs> so it's single malt scotch, 100% malted barley, aged 11 years, and is 92 proof. I don't know. Let's get to it. Mmm, that is smoky. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just lots of notes of burnt logs. <laughs> oh yeah that's like actually smells a bit like liquid smoke you know that stuff mm. you put in for ma- marination no 
I think liquid kinda, smoke yeah. it's kind of smells more fake to me, but but yeah, it's evokes similar feelings. Okay. H- how does it work here? Do you do you pull up the tasting notes and mm, mm-mm. see what you got? We make it all up. Yeah, Whatever we totally... you smell and taste, just roll with it. Yeah, I get a little orange in there. So I don't know if you've ever like when you say you make like an like an old fashioned or a Sazerac or whatever, you know, th- like you'll burn a little bit of the peel to like draw the oils out before you do the little twisty squeezy thing. I get that. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting right there. A bit of smoke, a, a bit of like orange oil from the peel kind of like, I don't know. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. We've also really worked on our powers of suggestion, Rich. And so <laughs> we're going to say some things and then you're going to somehow figure it out. Like, I don't know, a little bit of red vines, a little <laughs> bit of red vines in the middle. You know, those like better than Twizzler kind of mm. licorice things. Perhaps Swedish fish. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you're leaving me behind on that one, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're just seeing where we can get. Thanks for calling us on our bullshit. No, really, it actually just kind of has just it, it's heavy smoke in the beginning. It definitely gives me some of that orange. It's got a little burn, not too bad. It's overall um, pretty smooth. Yeah, man, that smoke hangs out for a bit. So I'm, a little leather, a little leather in there for me. There's no right answers here, by the way, too. So that's why we don't even get out like tasting notes because it's just whatever words that you can correlate that we all know what it means it's, it's definitely got a like a bitterness to it that that lingers but not in an unpleasant way kind of like oh. like in the way that coffee is bitter yeah 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 i can kind of get that a little bit the way that like maybe an espresso or something hangs out a little bit on the back of your throat yeah i'm not getting any like but i that bitterness does kind of i think that's what i was trying to call leather which I do chew on mm. from time to time, but yeah, I think. <laughs> hmm. All right, Rich. So since you are our one and only uh, avid listener, you're probably very familiar with this rating system, <laughs> but since you're on, other people might be listening. So it works like this. It's a really well thought out and uh, in-depth rating system. Zero to eight t- tentacles. Zero being absolutely terrible. I don't want this. What was Nick Offerman thinking? Four being like, not bad. I guess I'd have it again, but it's not the best thing I've ever had. And obviously eight is exactly that. Amazing. This is all I want to drink. And you won't have to go first. So, you know, we, we never force that upon our guests unless you would truly like to go first. No, no. Go ahead. Nah. All right. <laughs> Robbie's up. I always throw him under the bus. Oh, man. I think. Yeah, I... This one is pretty smoky for me. I'm having a hard time like getting any other flavor notes other than smoke, which is not my favorite. That being said, I would drink it. Like I've had some scotches that I have a couple sips and I'm like, I'm just not gonna drink that. So this one is not terrible. I'm gonna give it middle of the road like a four. Okay. Yeah. Also not a regular scotch drinker, but I tend to prefer things, I believe like Macallan, that kind of thing. So the not a strong smoke, not a strong peat. It, I think it leans more towards peaty, like things like Macallan. But for what this is, I mean, it obviously evokes the, the flavors that they're going for there. And this is less of a, a smoke bomb for me than some other Lagavulins have, have been. Um, so I, I'm probably going to put it at like a five for me. So like it's interesting, it's distinct. Uh, I do appreciate that it's got a little more in the burn, a little more in the heat. I, I want some of that that hug, I say. But yeah, I think it's just in general like smoke, super smoky isn't for me. Maybe camping. If I was camping, I'd be like into this because I'm already getting that. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Actually, like uh, I'm, I'm drinking this, and I I feel like I'm sitting by a, a bonfire in the Scottish Highlands. Drinking it makes me feel sophisticated, you know. I, I did, I do like like scotch a, a little more. Like it's what I grew up drinking. Um, I have developed more of a taste for bourbon, you know, American whiskey since I've been living here. But like scotch is still my my go to, and I do tend to lean towards the smokier whiskeys. So this is 
right up my alley. I would, I would give this a ooh, six and a half. Yeah, I think that's pretty solid. Yeah. Have you been camping in the Scottish Highlands? I have not. Oh, okay. I was going to say, because that sounds but amazing. I, I have been to the Scottish Highlands and I have been camping. And if I combine those, those two experiences, then I can imagine what it's like. <laughs> yeah, you, you can get Cold an mostly. idea there. Yeah, I guess there's that. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a pretty decent, solid rating. Have you had the... So there's like a campfire whiskey by a distillery out of Utah. And it's like... A, what am I thinking of? It's... Robbie, we've had their other things. No, yeah. There's like a blue oh. rye, which is a bourbon rye blend. And then they have another one called like American Campfire Whiskey. And it has a lot of smoke to it, too. I would suggest trying that if you're kind of like in the mood for smoky, but then maybe you want to try some different High flavors along with it. High West, that's it. Yep, that's all out of Park City, Utah is where their distillery is. It's very interesting because like their founder is a chemical engineer who decided like who was you know really into whiskeys and he was like, I can go out here and I can test these chemically to put together particular like well-suited flavor, flavor profiles. And has done really well for that. So I would say I have been to High West, but I I don't think I've tried that specific whiskey. Oh, well, cool. Yeah, I would I would suggest trying that. Like if you do tend to lean towards smokier, but then like if you want to evoke some of the flavors of more of a bourbon or rye, like an American version of those, like it's Mm -hmm. a nice, nice like mix of that. Anyway, yeah, food for flavor I enjoy is spice. Should we get? Get into some hot takes. <laughs> <laughs> sure, let's get into some hot takes. You such a smooth segue. Yes, I know, right? Uh, he's been working on that for a long time. He's learned <laughs> over time how to like nudge me through when I start like just blah 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 blah, blah a bunch. So, <laughs> happens here and there. Yeah, somebody's got to keep this train on the tracks here. Yeah, so the the first one we usually ask is a little bit uh, different here. And I have several tiers to how I want to ask this, but I'll just ask it as normal first. So if you're using TypeScript, do you use explicit types or inferred types? Inferred to the extent possible. I mean, that's the whole point, right? It's supposed to be doing grunt work for me. The the only time I'll really do explicit types is if I have like a very long function and I want to explicitly set the return value, but everything else is inferred otherwise why am i using typescript yeah totally agree that's a a lead-in response right there (laughs) yeah and i uh i wanted to follow up because i think like and correct me if i'm totally remembering this wrong but i feel like svelte removed all of typescript at some point like the internals are not typescript anymore or something like that they are typescript but they're not written in typescript so we, we love TypeScript. Okay. I love TypeScript. I'm a huge TypeScript fan. I could not live without TypeScript, which is actually kind of sad when you say it out loud. <laughs> but what we did is we removed the .ts files from the code base. Instead, we have JavaScript files and all of our TypeScript is expressed using JS doc annotations. But it's still type checked with TypeScript. We still get all of the same level of type safety. We just don't have to compile the code before it runs. Hmm. Sure. And that that is how I build... All of my libraries is I put the types in JS doc. It's a little bit more work. You know, you have to deal with a, a slightly less concise syntax, but you get exactly the same expressive power. And the stuff that you ship hasn't been through like layers of transpilation. And it, it makes developing libraries so much easier. I wouldn't do it for applications. Like I, I use TypeScript when I'm building apps because yeah. like I want to have a build step there. But for libraries, you don't need it. Get rid of yeah. it. You'll be so much happier. Yeah, that's, if you do. that's a big problem right now. Is like so we we just converted uh, Shepherd to TypeScript and like trying to get it to ship the like build and ship those declaration files in the right place to where when you import stuff it like finds them and everything is like harder than it should be. So if you're just yeah. shipping the JavaScript and using it, then that's I can see the appeal of that for sure. Yeah, I mean, we are still running TypeScript to generate declaration files when we publish the package. Oh, okay. Um, like, that's very important because if someone's consuming the package, like, TypeScript isn't going to go into the contents of your node modules and, like, 
figure out the types of, of your stuff. Like you have to have a DTS file. Otherwise, types is going to be like, yeah, whatever. Don't care. Not mm. doing that. Okay, so it doesn't and, fix that problem. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't fix that problem. And, and like, oh, I, that's kind of annoying. Like I wish it did. I wish that TypeScript was just, I don't know, fast enough or whatever enough to just do that. But that's not the world that we live in. And so you still need to ship DTS files when you ship a package if you want the people using your library to have a good type safety experience. But it doesn't mean that you need to actually transpile the code. And if you do it right, then you know you can you can ship a, a package in such a way that when someone command clicks on something that they've imported from your library, it will take them directly to the source code inside their node modules where they can like add a console.log statement or a debugger statement and actually understand what's happening inside inside that package. Or if you know if you want to clone a, a, a repository of, of a library and link that to your to your application, then you can make edits inside your application in your node modules. And then when you're ready to, to open a pull request, the changes are already there. And this is a, a way of working that I, I think everyone was used to like 10 or 15 years ago, yep. like bef before the rise of the, like the industrialization of, of all of this stuff. And now no one does it. And, and no one even understands like what we're missing by by jumping through all of these absurd hoops in order to publish stuff these days. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta write up all of this. I've got to like put it in an article that I can reference somewhere because all the time people ask me this question about this TypeScript versus JS doc thing. And there are so many misconceptions about it, but I really feel like the entire ecosystem is just missing a trick here. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good trick too to like get all of the benefits of TypeScript without additional compilation. I'm sure some people like show up to your library and just see JS files and make the assumption that like, oh, okay, they're not using it, right? Like it's easy to have that quick glance opinion to it. That's a very interesting perspective to take and I think definitely one worth writing about for, for reference for other people because – it just seems kind of logical in the same way, like the question around inferred versus explicit, right? Like, you know, what it depends on the context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I know that the inferred versus explicit is a a little bit more controversial. Like a a lot of people have the exact opposite opinion to us. Yeah, but I mean, They're I wrong, think it's. But yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's controversial yeah. in a bubble where these hot takes come from though so let's bear that in mind too is it like mm -hmm. it's controversial there there's a lot of people that probably don't care to debate it you know and can take like constructive feedback and and make a, a smart decision there just to be productive really yeah. yeah anyway all right now to the important question i think which is Tailwind or vanilla CSS? Ooh, I, ah, uh, this is, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I like Tailwind. I like Tailwind a lot more than I thought I would like Tailwind. For a long time, I was one of these people who looked at, at markup with Tailwind in it. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing, people? This is absolute madness. Yeah. And then like I used it and I discovered that it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I'd always been very sold by the, the high-level concept of Tailwind. There's this essay that Adam wrote years ago, like explaining why Tailwind exists. And I read that essay and I was like, this makes so much sense. So yeah. why do I hate the look of it so much? But <laughs> once you start actually using it, like you don't really mind the way that it looks. And, and I, I really feel like a lot of the people who rail against Tailwind they just haven't used it yet. They're just so yeah. like stuck in a particular mindset that, that they, they, they won't even get that far. If you try it, you will like it. It does have some, some limitations though. Like there are certain things that are pretty difficult to do with Tailwind. Like, you know, a lot of the harder problems that you encounter when writing CSS are, are to do with the relationship between different elements. Yeah. It's not just the styles that go on a specific element. It's like this element when it's next to this element or like a parent of this, like stuff like that is a little bit more finicky to express with Tailwind. 
and so there are certain limits i think to where tailwind is applicable and if i'm gonna have to break out of tailwind for that last five percent then that kind of lessens its usefulness a, a little bit to me and then there's just like the extra moving parts like i now i have this this extra tool in my stack that i need to worry about that I need to up, update when there's a new version and things like that. And like, I always want to minimize the number of moving parts that I'm having to deal with. And so my answer is, this is why I was like vacillating at the beginning of this answer, is there's a lot to, the, to really love about Tailwind, but then like the bar for whether or not something should be included in a project is so high. And I'm just not decided as to whether Tailwind clears that bar for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that it makes you incredibly productive, right? And let's say you're working towards like the MVP of a project, right? You're not, you're not way down the path where scale exists, users exist, all of those things. But if you're just trying to build a thing and be incredibly productive, you're probably introducing a lot of ugly code to begin with. So what are, what are some, some additional strings on your JSX, like, or whatever it like, you know, for me, I remember early days React and seeing JSX basically having HTML in my JavaScript, and I had the same reaction. I was like, what is this shit? We've been fighting for years to have a separation of concerns, and now I've got this crap back in my files. Then later on, you had, like, uh, you know, the, the styles, CSS, which was, like, basically, you know, POJOs and CSS right in that same file, and the whole thing is a mishmash. So getting just strings to a degree kind of felt like, well, there's a slight regression here that I'm, that I'm open to. But like you're saying is, like, when the nature of your UI becomes more complex, then it's a bigger question of, like, you know, are you just building a dashboard with CRUD operations or are you doing something that maybe like this abstraction becomes counterproductive on. Yeah. So I, you made a really interesting point there about like combining your markup inside your JavaScript and then like, why wouldn't you have your styles there, there as well? Like the, the trend over the last 10 years or so has been towards greater and greater encapsulation. Um, initially it was like, you want to have your markup and your behaviors together. And then we started thinking about like CSS and JS solutions so that you can have your CSS as part of your component as well. And then yeah. now with things like React Server Components, a lot of people are thinking about how you co-locate your data requirements with your components. And there's like a very clear trajectory here that the, that the industry is, is kind of going on. And I think one of the reasons that the Svelte community has been a little bit slow to adopt Tailwind relative to other communities is that we already have that. When you write a Svelte component, you're writing what is essentially a superset of HTML. And inside that superset of HTML, you can just write CSS in a style tag and it gets scoped to that component. So it, it solves that problem of like, how do I have styles that are associated with my component, but you still get to write vanilla CSS. And so you have your nice clean markup, you have your co-location, um, and because of that, like, I, I just think a lot of people just didn't feel the need for it. But the co-location that you get with Tailwind is, is like as co-located as you can be. It's right there on the element. And you don't have to name anything. You don't have to come up with like the, the name of yeah. the element so that you can have a class name that targets it. And that is just, that is just so nice. And as you say, mm -hmm. you're moving quickly. Like, you don't have time for naming stuff. Yeah, you're just like, whatever, yeah, this is the name. The it sounds kind of like what, what it is in MDN or whatever else. Great, that's yeah. what it's called. Wrapper, yeah. container, card, card, yeah. container, wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or BEM, yeah. you go down like the, yeah, no, the whole like no, BEM don't. ideology. And Can it BEM made be gone? I, I mean, it, it <laughs> fixed a lot of problems for me back in the day when I was at Nat Geo. So I loved it then. Obviously, we have a different set of tools and yeah. different problems. I mean, Angular 1 fixed a lot of problems for me, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. I mean, maybe if you're coming from Backbone or something, and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is better. I don't know. Yeah. yeah there was definitely things there. I will have a follow-up question, but I know we want to get through some of these hot, hot takes. So when you were at the New York Times, were you doing in, interactive development then predominantly? Okay. I want to come back. Yeah, my, my background is in journalism rather than development. Yeah. 
I, I drifted into JavaScript as a way of doing more interesting journalism, essentially. Did you, did you have anything to do with Snowfall or no? No, S- Snowfall was before my time at the Times. I was still at The Guardian when that came out. Oh, okay. Yeah, Actually, no, mean. Christ, Snowfall, that was, I think I, I might have been still in the UK. That might have been before I, I was an, a newsroom developer. Yeah, I want to say that was probably around 2012, 2013, maybe, something like that. I, I, want, to, I want to Google that now, Snowfall... Yeah, yeah. And then Robbie will have another question for you. Tunnel Creek. Oh, yeah. Going down the hot takes, bro. Bro. Yeah, 2012. Man, this is a long time ago. But that Wait, was. It's not that long. <laughs> but that was like a, a, a seminal moment in, in digital journalism. That was the point at which a lot of people realized that, oh, if you, if you start to use web technology like to its full potential, then you can do things in a in a richer and more immersive way than you can just do with text and images. And I I don't know that we've fully lived up to the promise of those early days. No. Um, like a, a lot of stuff has sort of been kind of templatized and 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 so on. There aren't that many places doing that kind of work. Yeah. But yeah. Th- like there's there's still this this idea that just the nature of the web. Like, is this fundamentally new medium that we haven't yet figured out how to completely capitalize on? Well, if we bring flashback, it'll get easier. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jay's doing a lot of cool stuff. He just needs to teach us, the rest of us, how to do it. Well, so. <laughs> you need to f- figure out. So after Snowfall came out, basically I was part of a team that was tasked with figuring out how to ha- create a CMS to allow them to do that with, like, a choice number of Nat Geo magazine articles. They wanted to translate magazine articles into that format and create this whole CMS. There would eventually be, they could regress back through the entire catalog. Needless to say, we failed. But Nat Geo did some amazing stuff with like 3D reconstructions of fossils and stuff like that. Yeah. Like that, that stuff always went straight on my jealousy list. <laughs> I didn't make any of those things, so you don't have to worry about that. I did like advertising tech and some other stuff, but anyway. All right. right. Uh, get rebase or get merge? I, I mean, that's an easy one. Get merge because I don't really know what get rebase does. I know I should know. <laughs> I, I, I've been writing code long enough that I should know more git than I do, but I, I, just, I just know the basics. All right. As a, do you think Guillermo's up for hiring a manager for you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because, or, or, or just a senior peer, which would be a fallacy. But anyway, it still would be, just be fun for me to like <laughs> eat a bag of the Funyuns get and consult. throw, yeah, yeah. and th- <laughs> and throw like some old like get manual at you and just be like RTFM. <laughs> I'm not taking your merges. Declined. I I need that. I get in trouble with with my teammates every time I forget to enable squashing. Oh, just like yeah. reams and reams and reams of fix typo oops wip <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's great yeah. all right see so everyone is flawed yeah 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 just hit him up let him know a he owes me a bottle of whiskey and two <laughs> that if if you want if you want a man an experienced manager to take you down the old school path i'm here i'm here for you bro Anyway, yeah, all tongue in cheek here, you know. Was GraphQL a mistake? Oh, God. I think GraphQL was an interesting detour. I think it was a a very clever idea that picked up more steam than maybe it should have. And I think that back when it came out, like we, I, I, I don't know that people could have predicted some of the ways in which front-end technology is developed. Looking back in hindsight, like it's clear that that wasn't the right direction for for most things. But at the time, it, it, was, a, it was a super interesting idea, and like a lot of money was made building things around GraphQL. People yeah. had a great time. So I, I don't think we should go back in history and change anything about 
GraphQL, but uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know that GraphQL is the future of anything. Yeah, yeah. I do I mean, want to th- spin use. that a second here. So similarly, do you think people that all just kind of blindly chose React over the last decade and didn't try things like Svelte or Vue also had a similar problem of like just picking the hot thing and like rolling with it without understanding it? So, so that is definitely a problem in our industry in general. It, it's it's kind of a bugbear of nine, not, not because people aren't like evaluating, like I, I can give a shit if people are using Svelte or not, but the fact that the average developer is pretty much completely oblivious to how their tools work is not good. It is an indictment. Yeah. Like our, yeah. our industry needs to get a whole lot better treating these things with like the care and attention that, that they deserve. Like, I don't think that other industries have the same sort of lackadaisical approach to to like the, the things that we use to, to do our jobs professionally. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't really want to like get into sort of naming and shaming, but I, I'll, I'll give you one example for free <laughs> since you, th- this is supposed to be the, the spicy segment. ES build. A lot of people piled into ES build, but ES build doesn't generate particularly good output. Like compared to some of the alternatives to ES build. Right. It, it leaves a lot of removable code in your eventual bundle. And that is like a, a little bit of a problem. Like the, the whole reason that we're bundling stuff and that we're subjecting code to build steps is to provide users with the optimal experience. And that means having as small a bundle as possible. And like a lot of people picked a tool that doesn't do that as well as some other tools. And the reason they did that is because it's the one that felt the nicest and the fastest to use for them. And so the mm. users are suffering because they made a decision based on their own needs. And I, be- uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to get yelled at for calling out ES build here, but like, <laughs> this is just a, a general problem with tools generally that Wait, people don't understand them. You already have people yelling at you. I guess you don't need me. So first of all, <laughs> Yeah, you know, maybe someone on the internet will yell out. But uh, and to be clear, like ES Build is an incredible piece of software. It is it is a brilliant package, and it serves a a very useful need, and it's very well made, and it has inspired a lot of really important development in the ecosystem. My gripe is not with the existence of ES Build or its creator Evan. Like massive respect to the project and the people who work on it. My gripe is with people opting to use it and not doing a, a deep dive and a thorough evaluation on what trade-offs they're making on behalf of their users. Well, yeah, yeah I, th- I think that there is a fallacy in the process. So I think you've highlighted something very interesting there is that there's more of a, a preference towards developer experience over mm-hmm. user experience, yeah. which is which kind developers of like a are going to do because they're the developers. <laughs> like, well, yeah, they right. What's good and for them? Yeah, yeah, they're like somebody cares about how hard this is. This process is to go through. Maybe I, I mean, suffice is to say, Vercel is not. I mean, they're a part of that process in a way, right? Like they provide like a really great fast interface for developers to deploy particular types of apps, right? Like, it's a similar thing. I'm not saying they're doing anything bad. I'm just saying that, like, it feels like over the last five years or so that uh, there's been a lot of marketing and preference towards improving friction for developers. Yeah. Like, their tools... Use the easy button. Easy button for everything. <laughs> I, I wrote code. I want to get it. I want to see what happens. And I don't have to think about... A, B, C, D things. And I think there are implications to that. There, there so. are, there are. And I'm, I'm guilty of it too, insofar as nowadays when I, when I talk to people about Svelte in the context of trying to explain why they might want to use it, I, I tend to focus on the fact that it allows you to build things more easily than some of the alternatives. When I first started working on it, all I would talk about is, look how much faster it is. Look how much smaller right. your applications are going to be if you use this thing versus, you know, this clunky old other framework. And now, like, w- what I realized after working on this for a few years is no one gives a shit. But as soon as I started talking about, <laughs> hey, look how much easier this is, 
everyone was like, all right, sign me up. I want yep. some of that. <laughs> and the, it's, it's okay to, it's not just okay. It's good to focus on developer experience. Like the faster we can build stuff, the more stuff we can make, the better we can make it. Yeah. But if there is a tension between developer experience and user experience, then we are abdicating our professional responsibility if we don't resolve that tension in favor of user experience. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's literally in, in the W3C's priority of constituencies, right? Prefer users over authors. Which over, we've all read. Uh, we've all like, read those. So. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't even yeah. need to finish it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I mean, so yeah, like assumed, but. the the cell does talk a lot about developer experience. It's true internally. Like I see the the like a lot of the, the Slack messages from other people on the engineering team, and like, the the people who who work on the edge network and and like the actual infrastructure of the company are so laser focused on um, like minimizing latency and building things in a way that is. Good for you. And I'm not just like saying this because I'm a Vassell shill. I'm a little bit of a Vassell shill. I have to be because I work there. But like, <laughs> yeah, for sure. The, 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 internally, people are laser focused on user experience. But marketing wise, unless you can sort of turn that into, you know, look, look how many millions of dollars your enterprise will, will not lose to customers who, who left because it was a slow slide or whatever. Like right. that, that is not the, that is not what resonates in a marketing context. Yeah. And I get that. It's an interesting thing, actually, if you think about, so we're making a lot of things easier for developers, which, but then we're increasing complexity in other areas too, though. Right. So like there becomes like this ever growing onus on understanding like so many of like the internals of the libraries and stuff that we're working on that maybe we can't think about like the output of it, how it affects like browser scores and things like that. It just kind of reminds me how, I mean, 10 years ago, you had people working in uh, like that were focused completely on performance. 100% of their job was performance in the way that like developer relations is such a like a normal function now. Previously, mm -hmm. there was not that at all. And there was like performance because that was a part of what helped like our users have a better experience and them having a better experience, kept them on our site, sold our stuff, whatever we were trying to do. And then conversely, we had accessibility as a big part of that. So I feel like those are things that have unfortunately kind of been less of a priority in favor of some of these other other like developer ergonomics like things. Yeah, and sadly, I, I think I agree with that. Oh, I don't know, just just like a point to note out. But then, like conversely, we're just like think uh, part of the, I think part of the issue there is that you know companies, and in particular like non tech companies, they don't know how to structure a team to sort of cover all of that. They don't know how to hire for that. They don't know right. Like, and then conversely, even let's say technology focused companies especially depending upon where you are in the journey of building your company a, a developer relations person to help like bridge that gap and get you developer customers because you're building tools for them that's more important than like the finality of your product and how users engage with that because which one moves the needle and that's what you care about right now mm -hmm. yeah it's tough i mean I, I don't think there are any straightforward answers to how you get people to care about the right things. Yeah. But I do think that we should continue to call it out and, and talk yeah. about it. That's really all we can do at this point, because I certainly don't profess to like have the answer of like, this is the perfectly structured development team in order to create a, you know, a product, but also do right. Yeah. 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 There just is too much stuff to like, everybody can't know everything. So if you don't have someone that's like focusing on accessibility, then yes, the rest of us should know about it. But like, yeah, it just becomes like, if you're expected to kind of do a little bit of infrastructure DevOpsy stuff and do a little front end, do a little back end, do a little, like you're not going to be an expert at any of those pieces because you've had to do so many different things. So like, I think we're at a detriment of like, just kind of new things come out and we just tack it onto someone's job versus like getting specialists in each thing. And there you go. That's a statement. There's no <laughs> question there. So we can 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> well, uh, confession, you, your audio went silent for, for most of what, whatever you just said. Sorry, no, 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 no. Oh, yes, okay. yes. I no see worries. Dropping out for me. What I do want to circle to here, I don't know if we finish these hot takes. I don't think so. But Svelte 5 and Runes and I don't know. Tell me about the new stuff coming out. Like how is it different than Svelte 4? I don't know. What's, what's hot and new and cool in Svelte land? So it's a ground up rewrite for one thing. We basically discovered that the, the model that, that we introduced in 2019 was, was Svelte 3 and which continued in Svelte 4. You can, you can take it a very long way, but because it's been around long enough that people are starting to really push the, the boundaries of, of what you can do with the framework, we've basically hit, hit the limit. And what I'm talking about is the fact that because Svelte is a compiler and it, it kind of looks at your declarative component code and it, it, it turns it into tightly optimized JavaScript, we're, we're doing a lot of stuff with static analysis. And there are limits to what you can do with static analysis. And so Svelte 5 is sort of a, it's a ground up rewrite, first of all, but it's also kind of a ground up rethink of what writing component code should, should be like. And so it's a drop-in replacement to a large extent insofar as everything that worked in Svelte 4 continues to work. But under the hood, we've swapped out all of the guts with a signal-based implementation of reactivity. So shout out to the Solid team for really extolling the virtues of, of this way of building stuff. In Svelte 5, when, when values change, you get these super-targeted updates as opposed to mostly targeted updates, which you get in, in Svelte 3 and 4. And so as a result of that, it's, it's a lot faster, particularly in like the pathological cases where you have a, a very large list and just like one thing inside that list is changing. It, it's going to scale better than Svelte 4 did. You can have a lot of components on the page and they're not going to cost much, if at all. And we've also introduced this idea of, of universal reactivity. And this is where runes come in. So in Svelte 3 and 4, you can write JavaScript inside a component and it becomes magically reactive. You know, you have like a, a variable, like, you know, you want to do the, the classic demo button counter. You click on it and a counter increments. In Svelte 4, you just do let count equals zero. And then inside your click handle, you do count plus equals one. And... Svelte will figure out through static analysis what, what needs to happen in order for the DOM to update to reflect that, that new state. But you can't then take that logic and move it outside a component because then you're just back in regular old JavaScript land where obviously things do not magically update when you, when you reassign them. And so what we've done is we've, we've basically created a language extension to JavaScript, which we call runes. And it allows you to express reactivity directly in the language. You can mark a, a specific variable as being state, and you can mark uh, a variable that is derived from other pieces of state as a derived variable. And you can create effects, which do things in response to those variables changing. And you can put that inside your Svelte components, but you can also put it in .svelte.js files or .svelte.ts files. And so you can have the same reactivity inside components as outside components. Mm. And it's a little bit hard to, to describe on a podcast. This is not the ideal medium, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> candidly. Yeah, um, that's fair. But we've been working with this for a, a few months now. Um, it's getting close to a, a releasable state. And it's just really, really, really nice to work with. It it's, sort of makes JavaScript a valid language for building reactive user interfaces. Like up until now, we've had to jump through some pretty absurd hoops to make JavaScript suitable for describing declarative user interfaces because JavaScript is, you know, at a fundamental level, not designed for this task. And it, and it feels like we've made like a, a little bit of a breakthrough in, in how we think about some of these things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it kind of, 
I don't know if you've heard of Starbeam at all, the thing that Yehuda from Ember was working on. Um, but it, it sounds a little bit like that, like some primitives to do like kind of signals y, kind of like functional programming, hooks, kind of like kind of all the things, you know, people are used to in modern development, but like trying to. I mean, I guess it's not framework agnostic exactly, but it's like you can apply the same ideas to, you know, kind of whatever JavaScript. It, it is. I mean, the, the big difference with Starbeam and other things of that ilk is that like you're just interacting with variables as normal variables. So you're the 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 count example from from before in Svelte 4 you do let count equals 0, but that only works in this very specific context. In Svelte 5 you do let count equals dollar state parentheses 0. And that dollar state thing that is the rune. That is what we're calling a rune. But then after after that point you can do, you know, count plus equals 1, console.log count, whatever it is. Like that is just a value that you can use like any other. Whereas, you know, in Starbeam, you would create a thing called a cell and then you mm -hmm. access cell.current. And so you have to interact with, 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 with cells in this sort of framework or library specific way. And the same is true of, you know, view and solid and preact signals and all of these other things. Like it's just one step removed from JavaScript. And by the way, this is one thing that React got absolutely right. When you're, Dealing with state inside a React component, like, yeah, there are some gotchas that you've got to work around with use effect and use memo needing, like, the dependency array and, like, blah, blah, yeah. blah. But when you're actually interacting directly with the state, when you're reading the state, it's just variables. It's just values. Like, you don't need to think about, like, what type of thing this is. It's, like, a number is just a number. And yeah. that that sounds maybe like... It's not that important. But when you're actually working with it, like the bulk of the time that you spend authoring this stuff, you're dealing with state. Like our whole job is to take the state and turn it into a, like a, a representation for the user. And so when all of that state is just reactive by default and it's represented as normal values, it just feels different in a way that people kind of need to experience to understand. I mean, it sounds really cool, and I'm sure you're oversimplifying it. I mean, that that I mean, that sounds awesome. We use we use Svelte actually for our Shepherd library, our Tor library. So, I'm nice. looking forward to uh, to playing with some of that. Yeah, yeah. We don't use anything too complex, but uh, we'll definitely try out the new stuff. Yeah. Let's see. I forget what I was going to say. We're kind of towards the whatnot portion here now, I guess. So we should probably pivot a bit. If I just want to ask one question before you go down there. One more tech centric no. question. No. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I watched or I watched and or listened to some other podcasts with you as a guest. And it was like last year and Primogen asked you about if you like discuss with the next JS team on like how to solve issues and any overlaps since they're working on one particular framework and direction, you're obviously working on a different one, but still you're kind of in the same house. Like, is that a resource that ever overlaps and you have like kind of bounce ideas and discussions? A little bit. I mean, it's, it's definitely informal. Like we don't have regular meetings or anything like that, but like we're all friendly with each other and we'll, we'll share notes on some of the problems that we're solving in common, you know, some of the design decisions that we took in SvelteKit, which is the the application framework that is kind of the the next to React as wait, how, how am I saying this? SvelteKit <laughs> is to Svelte as as next is to React. Some of the design decisions that we made in SvelteKit regarding routing were like directly lifted from internal discussions that were happening within Next at the time that were not at that point public. And so <laughs> when when Next eventually unveiled their plans, people were like, oh, hey, this looks a little bit like Svelte Kit. <laughs> and, <there's a> <laughs> and you're like, that. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so we, yeah, we, we definitely compare notes from time to time. But it, it's not like a, like we're not like d doing it on, a, on any kind of a formalized basis. Yeah. You don't have to take that, do you? Or you're right. Well, my, mm -hmm. my phone? Yeah, I heard somebody's phone. No. I was just going to make a joke there. No, it can, it can wait. 
All right, fair enough. Thanks. <laughs> so anyway, Robbie, you were saying? Yeah, I was just going to say, if you were not in tech, what other career would you choose? And it can be like, you don't have to possess this skill already. Like, if there's just something you think is really fucking cool and you want to do that, like, you know, what what is your dream job outside of tech? I mean, I got to say, being in, being in journalism was extremely fun. Um, I, I got a little tired of it towards the end. I mean, the last 18 months of my my career at the Times was spent working on the coronavirus tracker almost exclusively. So in a time mm. when we were just living COVID, like you wake up in the morning and you're worrying about COVID, you go to bed at night, you're worrying about COVID. For that to be the day job as well, it's yeah. k- kind, of, kind of a lot. So like at the end of it, I was ready to do something different. But newsrooms are a super fun place to work. And if if I wasn't in tech, I would probably slink back to, to a newsroom and, and try and try and weasel my way back into that industry. When I was growing up, I believed that I was going to do some kind of like outdoor education thing, like okay. taking people like, you know, taking school kids kayaking and, and camping and like teaching survival skills and all that. Yeah. Stuff. Like I think that could have been super fun, but that, can set happen. that up for adults in the Scottish Highlands, and uh, maybe I was say, <laughs> you, yeah, you definitely strike me. We obviously don't know each other well, but uh, you strike me as someone I would gladly take a tour from. I'm like this guy, yeah, he knows where he's going. Let's follow him. In appreciate the woods. that. You, you've been making a terrible mistake, but I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I make a lot uh, of those. You know, you'll, you'll yeah. find that over time. <laughs> Honestly, my so my 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 plan B for when. AI comes and takes all of the tech jobs is like, you got to be doing something physical. You got to be doing something with your hands because that stuff is yeah. going to be the last stuff to go. And the, the, <laughs> my, my little daydream, maybe this is embarrassing, but I want to open a cookery school. Okay. I'm not a chef. I'm not a chef. I'm like a, an enthusiastic home cook. I probably wouldn't be doing the actual teaching, but I think that like, like having having a space where people can come and like learn cooking cooking skills is like something that the world needs more of. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Especially, what are some of your favorite things to cook? That's what I was gonna say. I I, I love to make fresh pasta. That's a favorite of mine. I, I I bake a lot. Like I I make I make fresh bread a couple of times a week. Oh, nice. Yeah, stuff like that. I'm I'm not like. Like Kenji Lopez Alt over here, just like <laughs> pushing the boundaries of culinary yeah. science. But you know, we, we you try can, and cook most of our meals here. Yeah, you can take care of yourself in the grand mm-hmm. scheme of things. You're and that's there. a fairly recent thing, actually. It was the beginning of the pandemic through a, a, a combination of needing to feed myself when everything was shut and also trying to impress a girl. Like I, I started learning how to cook. <laughs> yeah, the girl is now my wor- wife. So I was going to say, worked. so it worked out. So okay, yeah. it made some uh, yeah, good meals yeah, then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Robbie was asking, "What's your favorite shape pasta, or what shape pasta do you make?" I'm very basic. I make lasagna sheets and I make fettuccine. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I don't have the the tools that you need to make a lot of the more interesting pasta shapes. Uh, it's like quite an expensive hobby when when you really get into it. Yeah, I imagine. All right, there's a thing I must know. So since you're from since you're from the UK, I'm curious. Do you like football? No. <laughs> Everybody in tech <laughs> that is from Europe does not like fo- does not like football. I'm obsessed. I've you know played yeah. a, a good po- portion of my life watched for a very long time. I mean, I was alive and around during the 94 World Cup here in the States and, you know, have I went in I went to Brazil in 2014 and I've been to Europe in a bunch of matches there, but anyway, that's all boring to you because you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> womp, womp. Sorry. Yeah, I'm a I'm a bad ambassador for my country. Yeah, where part of the UK are you from? The North York Oh, okay. I've been to York, actually. Have? I, yeah, yeah. I to the have, new one. Yeah, <laughs> um, 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 uh, he lives in the New York. Yeah, like York is a really beautiful, very old city. I think like the newest stuff in the old town is like fifteenth century, sixteenth century, something like that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And they keep discovering new, 
new Roman ruins. Like before you do any construction, you have to have like a archaeological survey of the area, and they're always digging right. stuff up. Oh yeah, for sure. That's yeah, that's happened quite a few places actually. Uh, a bunch in Spain too, because since they were under that dictatorship for so long, like they didn't excavate a bunch of things. Every time they build a parking lot, they're like, "Oh, here's a new Roman ruin." Yeah, <laughs> I stayed in Leeds for like a month, so I was all over Yorkshire, up in the Dales oh, nice. and yeah, and fun. Manchester. Yeah, yeah, it's a very beautiful town as well. But lots of good football up there. Just saying. <laughs> Anyway. Uh, yeah. I think in the quick look at your Twitter that I was doing, I saw you were doing some skiing. Is that right? I was, yeah. I just had a couple of weeks in Colorado. Hmm. It's nice do you do that there. a lot? Not as much as I would like. I, this is the first trip in a couple of years. But I, I had like two separate trips planned kind of for for this winter and managed to just combine them into one mega trip so i had a, a week in breckenridge oh okay. beautiful l- lovely town and then a week in vale which i hadn't been to before the skiing there is just unreal you uh, yeah if you like that i would say go up to utah and alta is mm-hmm. the spot like park city's like fun and night you've probably done park city right since you're, i have yeah yeah. Have you been to Alta? I have not. That's the spot. That's the one. Ah, good to know. Yeah. Are you going to Epic Web Dev? Like the the Epic Web Conference, sorry. No. No, I don't no. have any conferences what is like that? that right now. Should I know when, what this is? It's like a week or two before React Miami. It's the one that Kent is putting on. And, you know, he's all about snow sports. So. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that he, like trapped someone into speaking there or something was like hey do you want to go on the skiing trip like uh, on yeah. uh, this date and they were like yeah yeah that'd be great and he's like well now that i know you don't have anything going on that day do you want to speak at this conference yeah i forgot <laughs> who he did that too yeah. that's pretty funny oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh well oh, anyway man. well that's a thing i guess if you yeah. worked on remix you know it'd be different yeah i mean there's too many conferences i can't keep up with all of them yeah they're starting to bump up to one another too it's like two yeah it's 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 pretty mad like is it like this in other industries is this just a, a or even other parts of the development industry? is it is this just a javascript thing i think i don't think i think some like just because of the nature of how fast things move there's like a bunch of different conferences but i think also like there's probably like a big I don't know, Java conference or like... They're also like, like Django Conf, right? Like they do yeah. one in the States, they do one in Europe. And so it's more like biannual. So yeah, I think that because there's so many different flavors, when's SvelteGit Conf? So <laughs> the Svelte Conf, the Svelte Summit, SvelteSummit.com mm. is happening mm. on April 27th. It's a virtual conference. Okay. Mm. We we had an in person one in twenty twenty two, I wanna say. And then we're hoping to have another one at, at some point in the near future. Yeah. But the one that's scheduled right now is April twenty seventh and it's gonna be on on YouTube. There you go. That's a good one. Yeah, we'll have to make sure we air this before then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, or yeah, just point. tweet about it or something. Yeah, yeah we've got a too. month. That can too. we do this? Jeez. I think we can make it work. Yeah. Listen, I got our, code to ship, man. I mean, <laughs> our producers, our video producers are just so slow and behind. They are. Yeah. Yeah. And they just always wear hats. It's weird. Yeah. They only wear hats, I think, <laughs> these days and grow beards. I don't know. Yeah. All right. We are about at time here. Before we end, is there anything we missed talking about or stuff you'd like to plug? Stuff I'd like to plug? No, just use Svelte. Go to svelte.dev. Learn all about it. Ashley, you you don't have to do that. (laughs) Go there, find out what it is, see if it's interesting to you. If not, then we will not be offended. But we think it's pretty cool and that people should check it out people seem to like it for the most part that's all i'm plugging right now and if you don't like that then go to remix i would skip all the other ones i don't know what else 
<laughs> publicly say we're gonna skip next is that what you're saying <laughs> next framework no, I'm just kidding. anyway i've used plenty of them no they're all all pretty good options these days indeed all right thanks everyone for listening if you liked it please subscribe leave us some ratings and reviews we appreciate it and we will catch you next time <laughs>